to read verse 15 to 17. Three verses. I want you to follow with me. Paul says, let the peace of God, some translations have Christ, rule in your hearts to which you are also called into one body and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. That's a thankful heart as well. And whatsoever, verse 17, you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks, there it is again, to God and the Father by Him. Someone once said, and I love it, the best way to know that you're carrying a full bucket is wet feet. You ever carried a bucket and it's to the brim filled and it's splashing all over your feet? Well, the same is true of our life. When our lives are full of Christ, they will overflow onto others around us and they will get wet. People will be able to tell that your life is overflowing with Christ. So Paul has commanded us to put off the grave clothes and to put on the grace clothes in verses 8 to 14. I want you to notice that in verse 8, put off all these anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication. Put these out of your mouth. Lie not one to another, verse 9, seeing you put off the old man with his deed. So we're to take off the old life and then notice we're to put on the new, verse 10, put on the new man, which is renewed after the knowledge of the image of him who created him. And he tells us in verse 12, to put on therefore as the elect of God, holy, beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, and long suffering. And we're to forbear with one another, forgiving one another. If any man has a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, do ye. And above all these, verse 14, he says, put on love, which is the bond of perfection. Now, I went back to verse 8 and read to verse 14 because you should always interpret a text in its context. If you take a text out of its context, then you can misinterpret a text not knowing what it's talking about. So Paul has been telling us this is how to live the abundant life. You died with Christ, so put off the old life. You've risen with Christ, so put on the new life. And he used the imagery of taking off soiled clothing and putting on new, fresh, clean clothes. So we take off the grave clothes of the old life and we put on the grace clothes of the new life and we are to walk in newness of life and our lives will overflow. But in our text today, verse 15 to 17, Paul actually gives us three commands which are to control the expression or overflow of the new life. So these are actually three imperatives or commands. They're not options. This is how we are to live the abundant life. Three things. Verse 15, let the peace of Christ rule. Verse 16, let the word of Christ dwell. And verse 17, let the name of Christ be glorified. I can't tell you how comprehensive these three things are for the believer. The peace of God ruling in our hearts, the Word of God dwelling in our lives, and the name of Christ being glorified in everything you say and everything you do. Now let's unpack all three of these commands is how we live the Christian life. First of all, verse 15, we're to let the peace of Christ rule. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which you are also called into one body, that's the church, and be ye thankful. Now, I want you to note four qualities in verse 15 of the peace of Christ. First of all, it's divine. In verse 15, let the peace of God or Christ rule. Now, you say, well, pastor, why is there some translations have peace of God and the others have peace of Christ? And I can't tell you for sure why there's a discrepancy there, but there's no conflict there. Both God the Father and God the Son and God the Holy Spirit are divine. So in this sense, it doesn't matter whether it's God the Father or God the Son or God the Holy Spirit. The basic principle is that it's the peace of God, whether it's God the Father, the Son, 
or the Holy Spirit. But a lot of modern translations based on manuscript evidence actually have that translated, let the peace of Christ rule. Let the word of Christ dwell. Let the name of Christ be glorified. So it seems to be more consistent to render that, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. So the moment we were converted, we had, and I know I say this a lot, but it's so important and foundational, we came into peace with, underline the word with, God. Before our conversion, we were at war with God. The Bible says there's no peace for the wicked, says the Lord. So this is why before you were saved, you had strife in your marriage, you had strife with other people, you had strife on the job, you had strife in the neighborhood. You just can't get along with anybody. Let me tell you why. Because you're out of fellowship with God. If you're out of fellowship with God, then your whole life is out of kilter, out of whack. In order to be right with others, you must be right with your Creator. And to be right with your Creator, you must repent of your sins, believe in Jesus Christ, and be born again. You say, well, can I kind of do it another way or find another religious path? No, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to the Father, that's God the Father, except by me. Jesus is the only way. So for you to have God, you must have Christ. So you must repent. That means change your mind, turn from your sin, and put your faith in Jesus Christ. And get what Jesus told Nicodemus he needed, being born again. The theological term is regenerated, given new life. And so now you have peace with God. And then what happens as the result of the byproduct is now you have the peace of God in your heart. So we move positionally from peace with God at salvation to the peace of God in a growing life of sanctification. So we have to walk then by faith and trust God and we have experienced His peace. Now the peace with God is Romans 5.1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And the peace of God is found in Philippians 4. Verse 7, and the peace of God which passes all understanding shall guard, keep, garrison your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. So those are two classic passages where we have peace with God, salvation, and the peace of God in sanctification. Now there's a, there's a whole sermon in this point. But let, let me say this, D.L. Moody used to say, a little faith will take your soul to heaven. That's another way of saying you'll be saved. It didn't take a lot of faith to get to heaven. It just takes a little faith in a great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's not the amount of your faith or the intensity of your faith. It's the object of your faith. And then once you are saved, a lot of faith, strong faith, great faith, will bring heaven to your soul right now on earth. So a little faith will get your soul to heaven. A lot of faith will bring heaven to your soul. So if you're struggling in this troubled world we live in right now, believe me, it's a troubled world. You need heaven to come down to your soul right now. And the only way to do that is to have a lot of faith. And have faith comes by hearing and hearing by God's Word. So the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, the peace of God ruling in you mightily, and the name of Christ being glorified in you wonderfully. That's the abundant Christian life. So Jesus said in John 14, verse 27, peace I leave with you. So he gave us his peace. I leave with you my peace. I give my peace to you. In the world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Now, I don't want to get too focused on this, but there's a lot of examples in the life of Christ where he had the peace and then also in the book of Acts, the early Christians, Peter was in prison, Acts 12, sleeping the night before he was to be executed. Now, how many of us would go to bed at night and sleep soundly knowing that my head is going to be severed from my body in the morning? I wouldn't be asleep. I have a hard enough time sleeping when I'm worried about other things, let alone dying the next day. But Peter was sound asleep. Why? Because the peace of Christ was ruling in his heart 
and in his life. He didn't worry about what would happen to him. Stephen in Acts 6, when he was being stoned, looked up to heaven and saw Jesus again, and his face was shining and the glory of God. He had God's peace. I love Acts 16, one of my favorite stories in the Bible where Paul and Silas were arrested, they were beaten, they were put in prison, they were in stocks, it was midnight, and what did they do? Sang praises unto God. Now, if John Miller were arrested, beaten, thrown in prison, put in stocks at midnight, he would so complain and gripe and get mad at God. But not Paul and Silas. They sang praises to God, and the prisoners heard them, and God sent an earthquake and delivered them. But notice the peace, notice the joy. In our text today, we're going to get a text about singing and worshiping God there in verse 16. Psalms, hymns, spiritual song singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, and so forth. So the Spirit-filled life is a joyful life. It's a peace-filled life. But they were worshiping even in their adverse circumstances. And then in Acts 27, Paul was on a ship as a prisoner to Rome, and they encountered a storm. But he saw God's peace in his heart. Paul was writing these words in verse 15 from where? A prison in Rome. Now, technically, it was a hired house, so he was under house arrest, but he was chained to a Roman soldier, and he was under arrest, waiting trial, possibly even death, but yet he says, let the peace of Christ rule in your heart and in your life. What a glorious experience that is for the believer. But notice it's not only a divine peace, it's a ruling peace in verse 15. It's to rule in your heart. What does that word rule mean? The word rule means, it's actually an athletic term. It means to act as umpire. So it's to act as umpire. It's an officiant. It means God's peace should arbitrate all our activities and our decision, not our anger, not our passions, but God's peace. God's will, God's peace, as is found in God's Word. Now, this is the subjective way God will lead us. Is it right? Is it wrong? Should I go this way or that way? The peace of God. If it comes from above, it's peaceable. So we have to say, God, give me your peace. Guide me by your peace. Help me discern your will. But at the same time, we get the next verse. We have to let the Word of Christ dwell in us richly because God's peace will never lead us contrary to God's Word. Don't forget that. God's peace will never lead you contrary to God's Word. I can't tell you how many times I've had couples come into my office, well, I want a divorce. Why? Because I found this other person and I have a peace about it. God's given me a peace and I'm to divorce my husband or my wife and I found this other person and we have a really great chemistry and I feel a peace about it. I think you do not have a peace. Well, yes, I do. No, you don't. Because it's contrary to God's Word. That's like saying, I have peace about robbing the bank right now. (laughs) Let's pray. Lord, as we go to rob the bank, watch over us, keep us. (laughs) Just let it go smooth for Your glory. I don't think so, Dodo Bird. (laughs) Forgive me. I better stop. I've had people look right at me, oh, Pastor Miller, I know it's God's will because I feel it in my heart. This is what the Bible says. It's right here in God's Word. Oh, I know the Bible says it, but I I just I just have a peace in my heart. No, 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 no. It's like the fellow that prayed, Lord, should I do this or that? And then he answers himself back, do whatever thou wantest, my child. I don't think so. Open your Bible. Get God's will for your life and then align that with God's peace and then throw in another way to know God's will, circumstances. But you have to guide everything by the Word of God because circumstances can be deceptive. Emotions and feelings can be deceptive. But God's Word is objectively true. If you want to know God's will, if you want to live a blessed life, Just get into God's Word. And I'm getting a bit ahead of myself because these are all intertwined. That's verse 16.
but it rules in our hearts or makes decisions or is an arbitrator. And then thirdly, notice this piece is a piece of unity, verse 15, to the which also you are called in one body. Now, why, why would Paul throw that in there? Because he knows that we're the family of God, we're brothers and sisters, we're the body of Christ, Christ is our head, and he wants us to get along with one another in the body of Christ. So it's talking about peace with others in the church, also peace in your marriage and in your family, and on the job and in your neighborhood. If you want to get along in your marriage, if you want to get along in your family, if you want to get along in the church, if you want to get along in your community, let Christ's peace rule in your hearts. How important that is. But notice, fourthly and lastly, that it's a peace that brings thanksgiving. Verse 15, And be ye thankful. It's all part of one command. Be ye thankful. Literally in the Greek, it's and thankful continually be. Some render this, learn to be thankful. Now, I I have to confess to you that I, I have a natural bent to look on negative sides of things. My wife sometimes will call me Mr. Negative because it just kind of flows naturally from me. Don't laugh. You you do the same things. Going, oh, Pastor Miller. <laughs> glass, is, glass is only half full, or this isn't right. You know, good job, but you should have done this, or you should have done that. It's not right. You know, if something's wrong, I'll find it. <laughs> and it's really hard for me to sometimes be thankful unless I think. You know, the word think and thank are tied together. When we think, about God and His grace and God and His mercy and God and His love, and we start to count our blessings. I love that old hymn, count your blessings, name them one by one. Count your blessings, see what God has done. We don't count our blessings, we count our bummers. And we write them down and we think about them and we get all eaten up. Take a time today and write down some of the things you're thankful for and go over and just thank the Lord for each one of those things that God has done for you by His grace, the goodness of God. As we enter into Christmas, we should enter with thanksgiving in our hearts. God's grace in salvation brings peace with God and peace of God, which turn brings a thankful heart. Write down 1 Thessalonians 5. 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 18. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, he doesn't say for everything, but in the midst of everything. This is Paul and Silas singing praises in the midst of a very deep, dark prison. So ask you, ask yourself, is my life overflowing with Christ's peace and thanksgiving? Notice the second command in verse 16 to control the abundant life is let the word of Christ dwell. Verse 16, let's read it. Let the word of Christ dwell, how? In you richly, doing that with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, there again in the body of Christ, in psalms, in hymns, spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts, which again is thanksgiving. Grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now what does Paul mean by Verse 16, the Word of Christ. Two things. Number one, he means the very words that Jesus spoke. If you have a red-letter Bible, it makes it pretty easy for you, right? Let the words of Christ found in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John dwell in you richly. And then secondly, I believe that it's a synonym for all of Scripture. It's the Word of God. Let the Word of God dwell in you richly. That's why I love how comprehensive these three commands are. When we live by faith, trusting God, living in the promises of His Word, and His Word dwells in us, then we have His peace, and then we are thankful. That's the way to live the Christian life. If we neglect God's Word, we won't experience His peace, we won't experience His presence, and we will be ungrateful, unthankful, and then, verse 17, we won't live lives that glorify God and honor God. 
So I believe that it's referring to all of Scripture. God's Word is to dwell in us. How? Notice it. Richly. Now the word dwell literally means to be at home. It's more than just reading the Word. It's letting the Word read you and have control of you. Giving the Word of God access to every part of your life. It's letting God's Word find its home in your heart. You ever use the expression when a visitor comes to your house, make yourself at home? We've all said that, right? We don't really mean that. (laughs) You want them to jump in your bed? You want them to go to the refrigerator, open up and drink out of the carton? And then belch? That's what I do at home. You want me to take my socks off and just throw them? You want me to brush my teeth and then spit on the mirror? That's what I do at home. No. What we mean is sit there and don't move. (laughs) And whatever you do, don't look in that back bedroom. We threw all the junk in there when we knew you were coming over. (laughs) They're going to be here in 30 minutes. Put all the junk in the back bedroom and shut the door. Well, God's Word wants to make itself at home in your heart. That means He wants to have access to every room. He wants to look in every drawer. He wants to open every cupboard. He wants to read every magazine. He wants to see what kind of music you're listening to. Every place you go. Your heart becomes Christ's home. And the Word of God permeates your life. What you think, what you say, what you do, all your actions and your attitudes are governed and controlled by the Scriptures, the Word of God. Now to do that, you're going to have to read the Bible. You're going to have to obey the Bible and put it into practice. In the book of James, it says, don't be just hearers of the Word, but be doers of the Word. If you only hear the Word and you don't do it, then you deceive your own selves. So as to dwell in us. How richly, verse 16, in all wisdom. This means that it's to be highly prized and appreciated. I like that. You're to appreciate and value and prize God's Word and let it have its way in your heart and in your home, in the church and in our world today. Now when God's Word is dwelling in us richly, what happens? Then we teach each other. That's the positive instruction, teaching God's Word. Then we admonish one another. It's warning and correcting. That's negative. Some preachers only preach positive sermons. But if you're preaching the Bible in its entirety, there's admonition, there's rebuke, there's warning. Write down 2 Timothy 3.16. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, that's what's right, reproof, that's what's wrong, For correction, that's how to get right. And instruction in righteousness, that's how to stay right. This is why the Bible's comprehensive. It's what we need to live our Christian lives. And then notice in verse 16, one another. So it's in the church, the context of the body of Christ, the family of God. How do we use God's Word? Well, we sing it in psalms. We sing it in our hymns. And we sing it in our spiritual songs. All songs must be biblical and scriptural and doctrinally sound. It's it's not okay for a preacher to preach false doctrine. It's not okay for a congregation to sing false doctrine. It must be biblically sound. So he puts us in these categories, and this is congregational singing. We're to sing the Psalms, God's playlist in the book of Psalms. We're to sing hymns, Songs of praise to the glory of God. Many of them found even in the text of Scripture. An example being 1 Timothy 1, verse 15. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It, it's, it's believed to be and rightfully so that that was the song that they, they sung. Jesus came into the world to save sinners. I am the chief. Chief Big Sinner. Now that would be a song that would be on the top ten list of today 
Songs today are about making me feel good and making me happy and you know all the things that I feel and think. They're not really directed to God and for the glory of God. I love what St. Augustine said, or Augustine. He insisted that there are three essentials of a hymn. Number one, it must be praise. Number two, it must be addressed to God. And number three, it must be sung. I like that. It must be praise, it must be directed to God, and it must be sung. And as Paul instructs us, it must be spiritual. Notice it there in verse 16. All songs are to be spiritual. So all other songs that are spiritual and that edify the believer and glorify God. Now, the word songs in the text could be used for secular or sacred. And I have people ask me, is it okay to listen to music that's not Christian music or religious music? And that's a matter of Christian liberty, and I'm not going to tell you what you can or can't do. That's when, like when people say, can Christians dance? I say, some can, some can't. <laughs> the ones I see dance should not dance. It's really embarrassing. Should Christians do this or that? I can't really hear. But notice in the text the word spiritual songs. He didn't say sing songs. He says you sing spiritual songs. My question is why wouldn't you want to listen to spiritual music anointed by the Holy Spirit that has biblical text and lyrics and edifies and glorifies Jesus and builds you up in the faith. So very important. Then notice in verse 16 that we're also fourthly to sing with what? Grace in our hearts and we do it unto the Lord. Every phrase in this verse is packed with important truth. Jesus puts the song in your heart. Christians have a joyful song to sing. Now, the Bible says that we sing, but it doesn't mean we have to sing Good. You might have a bad voice, but you should still sing because the Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord, okay? So it doesn't matter how good your voice is, it comes from your heart and it's directed to God. All the great revivals in the church's history involved revivals of singing. The Reformation brought singing back to the church. John Wesley and Charles Wesley, the great hymn writer, they brought singing back to the church. D.L. Moody and Ayer Sankey, they brought singing back to the church. During the Jesus movement of the 60s and the 70s, the Jesus people music brought worship and singing back into the church. It was a revival of contemporary worship at that time. Here at Revival Christian Fellowship, we sing, but our songs need to be spiritual. They need to be biblical. They need to be grounded in Scripture. And they need to be glorifying to Jesus Christ. And notice we sing how? Verse 16, with grace in our hearts and we do it unto the Lord. Those two characteristics. We do it with grace in our hearts means with graciousness or because of God's grace. Nothing will motivate you to sing more than understanding that you have been a recipient of the grace of God. Grace is unearned, undeserved, unmerited favor. You understand God's grace, it's going to set your heart singing. When you understand that God saved you by His grace, your response will be to worship Him with grace in your hearts or gratitude or thanksgiving to God. And you do it as unto the Lord. When we sing on Sunday morning, Wednesday night, and other times when we congregate, we're, we're not singing to one another. We're not singing to be impressed press others. We're singing to the Lord. We have an audience of one. So it's living in a thankful dependence upon God's grace for the song in your heart. And Jesus said in John 4 that they should be spiritual and they should be in truth. Now write down a great cross-reference. We won't turn there. But write down Ephesians 5, verse 18 to 21. Ephesians 5, 18 to 21. And I'll read it to you. Listen to what Paul said. And by the way, he wrote Ephesians the same time he wrote Colossians. 
from the same prison cell during the same period of time, one to Colossae, one to the Ephesians. He said in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, wherein is debauchery, but be filled or controlled by the Spirit. So we have the peace controlling our lives. We have the Word of God controlling our lives. Now we have the Spirit of God controlling our lives. Then he said, verse 19 of Ephesians 5, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns, spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your hearts to the Lord, giving thanks, there it is again, always for all things unto God the Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one to another in the respect of God. So this is the Christian life. You're joyful, you're thankful, and you're humble. Joyful, thankful, and humble. What is a Christian? Joyful, thankful, and humble. Because the Word of God, the peace of God, and the glory of God are controlling their hearts and their lives. Now, if the bucket of your life is overflowing, it will overflow in worship and thanksgiving. But notice thirdly, here's a description of the Christian life and a command. He says, whatever you do in word or deed, do all, and here it is, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God, even the Father, by Him. Giving thanks. Now, notice the peace of Christ is ruling. The Word of Christ is dwelling. And then our lives will bring glory to Christ in the way that we live. Now, what does Paul mean by the name of the Lord Jesus? He actually is talking about his person and his character. So everything we do, everything we say, should all be to glorify, to honor, and to magnify Jesus Christ. Let me break it down for you. The scope of this command is whatever you do in word or deed. Whatever you say or do, it's all of life. Secondly, all of life should be lived under the authority and for His glory. Verse 17, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus. Nothing should be permitted in our lives that cannot be associated with Jesus Christ. You know, the theater has been closed around here for a long time, but if you were going to go to a movie theater, ask yourself, is the movie I'm watching at home or my computer, does it glorify Jesus? If you were to go to the theater to see a movie and Jesus were riding in the car with you, would you say, Jesus, I think you should stay in the car. I'll come back after the movie. I don't think you want to see this. Or if you're sitting in the theater and you look over and Jesus is like this, <laughs> then maybe you're in the wrong place. Ask yourself, what I think, what I say, what I do, how I feel, does it glorify Jesus? Is He pleased? Does it bring a smile to His face? If that motors you or motivates you, then you're going to be living the abundant life to the glory of God. Notice thirdly, that all we do should be done with thanksgiving to God our Father. And I, and I do believe that all three verses have reference to being thankful. Verse 15, be thankful. Verse 16, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And verse 17, giving thanks to God the Father by Him. If there's anything that is a barometer or an indicator of your Spirit-filled life, it will be a thankful heart. A Spirit-filled Christian is a thankful Christian. Giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Literally in the Greek, it's becoming thankful. And notice in the context, as God is our Father, thanking Him for loving us, saving us, providing for us, taking care of us. If He feeds the birds, Matthew 6, He'll feed us. If He closes the, closes the flowers, He'll clothe us. He'll take care of us. He's our Father in heaven. So, let the peace of Christ rule in every area of your life. Let His Word dwell, settle down, and be at home in every area of your life. And let His name be glorified in every area of your life. 
and go back with me to verse 4. Notice the phrase in verse 4 of chapter 3 of Colossians. Christ who is our what? Life. I believe that that statement there in verse 4 is the overarching principle of everything we've covered for these three weeks on the abundant life. Christ who is our life. In Him we live, we move, we have our being. So His peace, His Word, and His glory. That's the Christian life. Amen?